Okay. So um, I will also be chairing the session, so then I will, I guess, introduce myself as the, the first speaker in the session, um, Jim Costello, University of Colorado. Um, and I was kind of brought in to help organize this particular challenge. So Liz gave a very nice overview of the data and how it was curated through uh, Project Datasphere. What I'll be talking about is the challenge itself, how we scored the challenge, winners, and so on and so forth. So uh, we had two sub-challenges within uh, the overall um, Prostate Cancer Dream Challenge. One was to predict overall survival. The second sub-challenge was to actually predict discontinuation due to adverse events, and I'll get into that in a little bit later. And really, this um, sub-challenge uh, two was comprised of um, a traditional, uh, let's see, McAfee, what do you, okay, how do I get out of this? Um, I'll risk it, okay, there we go, <laughs> perfect. Um, uh, sub-challenge one consisted of two kind of sub-challenges, sub-sub-challenges, I guess. One was the traditional predict overall survival that you guys are probably familiar with if you've done any types of survival analysis. And one B to this kind of a bonus challenge was actually looking at predicting exact time to event for the patients that we had time to event for. In this case, it would be death of the patient for overall survival. So I'll be talking a little bit about the properties of the clinical data. So getting after some of the questions that were just discussed. Um, results of the challenge, going insights that we learned, a bit of the future plans and kind of some of the things with, that's going on with the challenge itself, and then we're going to present the awards to the top performers. So sub-challenge 1A and 1B, again, um, you know, Liz already covered kind of what the data sets are, but essentially we had four clinical trials. We used basically combined three of them to represent the training data that we gave to you guys, and that consisted of, I think, about 150 or so clinical variants. Um, and that, that included everything from, you know, PSA, you know, your typical uh, prostate cancer measurements to things like um, blood panels, um, age, you know, sex, the, well, they're all going to be male in this case, but um, along with overall survival and then a flag with um, basically when they died and um, if they were censored or not. We took the AstraZeneca data set of 470 patients and basically split that into two data sets. So we had one that we used for the leaderboards and then one that we actually used for the final scoring, okay? So the way that we actually designed the challenge is to have a couple different rounds. So if you guys have participated in the Dream Challenges before, you should be familiar a little bit with the way that we set up these rounds. So Sage BioNetworks has done a really fantastic job at setting up um, these leaderboards. You know, people are allowed to submit their predictions directly through the Sage Synapse platform. It gets scored, you get an email back, how'd you perform, how'd you perform relative to a, um, in this case, a, um, a random model. And then um, over, over the course of the round, those scores are gathered and at the end of the round, they're posted. So they're made live, okay? We did that over three different rounds where in each of the rounds, we basically shuffled that 157 patient uh, test data set um, and then gave each team five submissions, okay? So we're trying to allow you guys to get submissions, but we're not trying to allow you to overfit to the data itself. And then we gave about three weeks for the final submission. So after you've, you've basically allowed to train your model those, over those different rounds, we said you get one shot on goal, and then we're gonna score you at the end, and that's where we determined uh, the winners of the challenge. And again, this particular challenge was predicting overall survival um, under the traditional model and predicting exact time to event for 1B. Sub-challenge two was slightly different. Um, essentially, we have the same data sets, um, and really the goal here was to say, okay, now that we have all of these clinical trial data that haven't really been compiled before, can we actually get after novel questions that haven't been asked or at least attempted to be answered before? And in this case, um, what we had was um, a question uh, put by the, um, the, the steering committee saying, well, you know, when you treat a patient with doxit um, docetaxel, uh, you know, they have, it's, it's a nasty drug and you could have pretty bad side effects. What would be great if you actually were able to look at the data and find patterns associated with people that are going to be discontinued from treatment based off of how they're responding to the drug treatment itself. So again, using all the clinical variables we had when we actually compiled this data, that's about 2,000 patients, that's giving you starting to get to the point where we have enough data to start addressing these types of questions. So in this case, we didn't have enough to run an actual leaderboard round. So essentially what we did was um, uh, we compiled the data, gave it to the participants, and asked them to predict adverse events based off of the full 470 patients participating there. Okay? So that's the challenge. Uh, a little bit about the data. Again, I'm not going to cover too much about this because I know Daniel from the winning team is going to describe a little bit more of, of the data itself. But 
you know, this covers some of the variables that we talked about. Um, you do get um, some are tighter than others. Some have wider distributions of values and um, impact in the overall prediction. Um, but then you have some of them that are, are kind of nice and tight here. This is the distribution of the patients in each of the different cohorts, okay? You can see that they're not completely uniform, okay? And I think that um, Daniel's actually gonna be talking a little bit about that within his talk too. Uh, the blue distribution is the AstraZeneca data set, um, but this just kind of gives you a sense of, of what data we made available and allowed people to participate. So just a quick summary, we had 571 total registrants, which was, I think, at the time, was, was, was the best, and then the, the AZ guys kind of beat us in that. But 180 active participants, about 70 teams. We had a clear winner for sub-challenge 1A. We had six top performers for both sub-challenge 1B and 2, and I'll talk a little bit about the scoring there. Um, uh, we essentially went and hand validated every one of the top performing methods, okay? So this gets to the whole issue of reproducibility and, and science and, and the dream challenges in and of themselves are a, are a mechanism to, to get that done. Um, obviously, we're at a full session in the dream conference. Uh, there's an Astra, there was a grant um, um, given out to the top performing teams from AstraZeneca to basically have monthly calls and we're talking about how to, uh, um, how to improve the scoring methodologies. Uh, Sub-challenge one uh, winners presented at the Prostate Cancer uh, Foundation retreat. Uh, 1A also is receiving an NCI contract, which we're going to have Dan Gallahan here. Here's Dan. You can say hi over there. He's going to be giving a, a short talk about um, the NCI's involvement in the dream challenges. Um, we're putting together an overview paper that's going to be submitted to Nature Biotechnology, and we also have an agreement with F1000 to publish the basically the methodologies, and this is extended to any any of the dream challenges. And this is uh, the criteria for submitting to F1000 research is, is determined by the challenge organizers. So we're allowing anybody to submit. Um, basically, the way it works is you submit your, your paper, it gets published online, and then it goes through the review process. Okay. So um, it's a nice framework. It's very open. This kind of synergizes with the goals of SAGE and DREAM, and this is why we wanted to do it. And then last thing is, is we're working with the AJCC um, to actually get prognostic calculators kind of approved. Um, typically, that's the group that does the, you know, TNM of, of cancer and, and how, the, how you do the staging. In this case, they're getting into the prognostic model business, and, and DREAM is one of those first places that they, they, they looked at to actually start getting models. Okay, so the scoring. Um, again, we split the AstraZeneca data set into two third, but one third, two third data um, um, subsets, excuse me. Um, Subchallenge 1A, we used the integrated area into the curve from six to 30 months. Um, and basically teams needed to outperform the Hallaby model. And the Hallaby model I'll talk a little bit about, but it's kind of the standard in the field currently. 1B, we use root mean squared error. And again, uh, the team needed to basically outperform a random model to be considered a top performer. Sub-challenge two, uh, we use the area under the curve, uh, under area under the precision recall curve for uh, people, uh, to people that were discontinued less than three months of treatment. And again, the teams needed to outperform a random model. Okay. And this is the, the paper that references um, the Hallaby model, Susan Hallaby, um, who developed kind of the, the, the standard in the field for metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer uh, prognostic models. Overall performance, so this is basically showing the teams that participated, ranked ordered according to their overall performance. Um, we did some resampling, so that's why there's a distribution on all those performances. And essentially, um, what you see here is the performance related to the integrated area into the curve, and then we also plotted the Bayes factor and the log P, uh, negative log P of the significance over the, the Hallaby model, saying that actually almost everybody outperformed um, the, the standard model on the field. Um, and here's the actual Hallaby model here. So we actually had really good performance overall. Teams were, were outperforming uh, the standard model and our top performing team um, significantly outperformed everybody else. So we had a very clear winner up for sub-challenge one, 1A. One so, we had a, I don't know if this has been done in dream, have we used base factor before in, in dream challenges? We have, okay. So I'll go through this quickly. But essentially when we did the bootstrapping and trying to determine if one team is actually better than, than another team, we essentially do the bootstrapping, score them, compare the scores, and that essentially, and then the difference of that is gonna give you a distribution of scores. We can calculate the probability of model one uh, winning given the data or probability of model zero winning given the data. In this case, what we see is, a, is an instance where model one is actually outperforming model zero um, in 80% of the cases. 
So the base factor in this case, you just run out the calculations and it's a base factor of four. So we require to have a base factor of three for any team to be considered a winner of the challenge. These are the results for 1B. Again, we have a distribution looking at root mean squared error, um, the other values plotted here. And in this case, we didn't actually have a very clear top winner. We had a group of winners that were actually performing, um, were, were top performers under our uh, criteria for scoring. So a little bit of the observations from the data itself. So if we look at, we can start looking at things like time dependent um, area under the curve. If we look at the six to 30 month time frame that I was describing that we scored this over, you can see that the, the green line is the top performing team. Um, the Hallaby model is that uh, little orangey one, and then the median, uh, mean is actually being plotted in red. You also see there's a little, some interesting patterns associated with this. We're kind of exploring to see why you get this dip at 15 months. It's 15 months. And interestingly, we kind of, this is the Hallaby paper that I was describing earlier. And we see that you actually get this kind of dip, which we see here um, with the data that we have versus the Hallaby model. But you also see there's this kind of dip at about 15 months that we see here. So it seems to be consistent between the data sets and different models. Uh, we're we're going to explore to see what's going on there. Um, I didn't start a timer, so, and there's no timer up here. So 10 more minutes. Okay. So we also went in to see um, if we can actually learn something beyond what Susan Hallaby had presented in her model. And in this case, we gave you guys a survey, the people who participated in the challenge of survey, and you said, you know, what variables did you find most informative, what models did you use, so on and so forth. And here's kind of an aggregation that um, actually Liz has been compiling and looking at uh, what are the interesting clinical variants that we might be able to gain some insight from that are novel, and novel in the sense that they haven't really been modeled, um, at least within the Hallaby, uh, Hallaby model itself. And you can see things like, you know, a representative of, of liver function along with some stuff related to um, um, blood content. Uh, you can see a couple of those uh, here are actually uh, presented as being quite informative uh, from the, um, the participants themselves. And this is, again, these variables that are highlighted in blue are ones that are beyond what Susan Hallaby presented in her paper. So these are the things we're trying to look for. Can we actually use the challenge to identify novel findings, novel insights to what's going on? So the 1B um, challenge was, was um, I would say, less successful than the 1A challenge. Um, it was kind of a, it was novel in the sense that we were acting, asking people to predict exact time to event. And what we actually see from the, the results is we can actually plot the red is the, is the real distribution of the data. And this is just days to event um, and then just the density that people plot uh, individual teams. Gray lines are individual teams and then the blue is the mean. And this is just another way to represent that. So we actually took the average, um, basically, difference of the true event versus the uh, predicted event. And what you see here is that you know people, on average, predicted roughly the mean. Okay, and this is what you see by this tight distribution instead of this more instead of this wider distribution of the real data. So unfortunately, the one B results weren't as informative as we had hoped. But um, you know, it was it was a bonus challenge, and we still learned a lot from one A. Sub-challenge two, um, again, this is predicting adverse uh, um, discontinuation due to adverse events for less than three months. There's the overall distribution of performances. Again, there wasn't a very clear winner, um, but we did have a group of about six top performers that performed better than the random model and, and, and met our statistical criteria. And you'll be hearing about actually two of them today. Um, again, this was a rather novel question. So, you know, there's not a whole lot of standard in the field of, of how you actually get after um, what, uh, what affects discontinuation due to these adverse events. So um, uh, hopefully you'll hear some insights from the um, top performing teams today. Um, you know, again, we were able to perform better than a random distribution, but, you know, there's still a great room for improvement for, for this particular sub-challenge. The one thing that we did look in more deeply with this particular sub-challenge is what we call this lift chart analysis. And essentially what this is looking at is, you know, if I predict you to discontinue within the top 20% of the, you know, the patients, you actually are highly enriched for being discontinued. So, you know, these are the types of things we're looking at. So you might not be able to predict everybody that's going to be discontinued, but you could predict within the top group of patients. If you're, if you're, if you're in that top group of patients, you're more likely to be discontinued. So that's the thing we're looking for. We also looked for, again, for comorbidities, comorbidities associated with adverse less than three months. Um, this is just an analysis of, of, of those comorbidities. 
Um, and I'm not going to go deeply into this, but we do see things that would make sense. So people with COPD and other types of um, comorbidities uh, tend to be more associated with discontinuation. So these are the types, again, these are the types of biological insights that we're looking for. Now, what would dream be without the wisdom of the crowds? So um, we did the same thing with, you know, that we've done in all previous challenges. And again, we find that, you know, if we're able to aggregate predictions from the top performing teams, that the overall performance is more robust than any individual performer themselves. Um, Sub-challenge one, you know, we did see a, a slight increase in performance, but <clears throat> not as much as, um, as basically sub-challenge two here. Um, which does suggest that, you know, again, there's, there's more room for improvement in sub-challenge two, and if we're able to actually leverage the group, the community, um, we can actually gain, uh, gain performance overall. Okay, so that covers largely the challenge, um, kind of future, future things that we're working on. So we're going to be submitting um, one, potentially two papers to Nature Biotechnology that cover the challenge itself. Again, I mentioned this F1000 Dream Channel. Um, I should have put the URL up there. But um, anybody, if you just Google search F1000 Research Dream Channel, you will find it. And there is a channel specifically dedicated to Dream. And anybody who wants to publish, um, and actually one of the nice things I should mention too, is you could publish um, presentations, so slides. So I'll put these slides up there, and they, they're publicly available. Uh, posters, you know, there's no criteria for submission. You submit it, and, it, and it's online, then it's referencing. Then you can reference it. Um, we're also talking about how we can improve, and this is kind of a general theme through through Gene, through Gene, Dream, is um, how we actually use uh, Synapse and the challenges as kind of a living benchmark. So, you know, we put a lot of effort in putting this data together. You know, Syna uh, Sage team has put a lot of effort in building this, um, this wonderful platform. Um, and we want to be able to use that for you guys to improve methods as you continue to continue your research. Uh, collaboration with the AJCC, I mentioned that briefly already. We're continuing that. And um, um, we're also talking with Project Data Sphere. You know, we'll see about potentially running some future dream challenges associated with the data. Um, if you guys have suggestions, such as see if you can find some genomics data associated with that, uh, let us know. I mean, that, obviously, that would be great. Um, we'll have to look at what data sets are available for that. Okay, with that come the, uh, comes the most important slide. So thanks to everybody that actually participated in the challenge. Uh, without you guys, we wouldn't actually have a challenge or be sitting here right now. Uh, challenge organizers, so I had a great team um, that worked with, you know, we worked very well together to, to put this all together, Sage Bio Networks. You know, you guys have been great in actually, you know, getting the platform together, making sure everything runs smoothly. Uh, I forgot one person on our advisory board, but, um, uh, these are the, the prostate cancer specialists that help advise us and help motivate the challenge. Uh, external supporters you'll hear from Dan today, um, along with collaborators from the AJCC. So with that, I think we are now at the presentation of the certificates for the winning team. So you, you don't have like music or anything? Or just... yeah, but you want one to sing. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not. <laughs> so... Um, we will present, do you want to come up here and present this? Or? Okay, so I think we have Daniel representing to actually. <coughs> actually, all the winning teams, can you please come here so that we, uh, we save time? Uh, yeah. Young, young fan and. Uh, and I made, I made these beautiful slides so we could stand under here if you okay. want to take. Are we having pictures taken or? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, one by one then. You want to go over here? For that? Yes. So where, do you, where do you start? Yes. Here. Down there. Okay, the next team we have up is uh, Yuan Fang. Yuan Fang. And last team. 
I'm gonna I'm gonna try it. Okay. Uh, Fatima yeah. Sayed Narsarah. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>